Welcome viewers. Uh, this is one of the interesting issues that we tend to discuss and we are looking at in the commonly asked questions. These are the questions that a lot of people tend to ask within the human resource management uh, space. Uh, so we are looking at, uh, we have done about four sessions with the commonly asked questions. This is the fifth session that we are doing today. So we are looking at to say, uh, what are some of the key questions that people tend to ask? So I'm trying to give out some of the uh, ideas. Uh, you can read on your own some of the things. You can read my book, A Guide to Human Resource Management Practice. You can also read the various labor laws, the Employment Act, the Labor Relations Act, the Occupational Safety Health Act, the Pension Act, the Gender Equality Act, the HIV AIDS Management Act, the Disabilities Act, amongst other acts of parliament. But uh, what is very, very important for us to appreciate is that some of these are some of the things that uh, maybe in one way or another, uh, we should be looking at them to say they have got different labor laws and they're guided by the labor laws. The HR processes which are not guided by the law, but also the HR processes which are guided by the law in context of Malawi, but can also be applied in other countries. Uh, because we, we all know that each and every country has got its own uh, labor laws. So whenever you're working in a particular country, you might need to wish to understand that what happens in that particular country. For example, if I am employed as an HR a person, maybe in Nigeria, I have to first understand uh, what how the labor relations uh, is like in Nigeria. What are the laws there? Uh, what does they say about whenever the issues of compensation, issues of safety, issues of HIV is uh, amongst the other things, these issues of unions, how do they work, what's the relationship between the employer and the employee. Likewise, if I'm to employ it, let's say in South Africa, in Botswana, in Ghana, in Egypt, even abroad, outside Africa, could be Asia, Europe, or Asia, the United States of America, or South America. Uh, amongst other countries, yeah. What we need to appreciate is that we have got certain labor laws that have to be followed. So whatever we are never trying to understand each and everything, we should be able to be aligning it to the labor laws pertaining to that particular country. Even lawyers, if you can be a lawyer, but when you are handling a case in Zambia, for example, you have to handle that case in line with the laws in Zambia. If you are handling in a, a, a case in Ukraine, you have to handle it in line with the laws that are applicable in that particular country. Likewise, in the United States of America, Argentina, Canada, wherever, you should be able to align it to the labor law, to the laws that are there. So that is what is very, very important. And that for what is making the HR or the Lego or even the Lego profession, even the HR profession exciting because uh, different countries have got different laws that are applicable. So in context of Malawi, for example, what I'm trying to uh, look at today is to say, uh, do you offer time? Who are eligible for overtime? Who are eligible within an organization? People have argued that to say who are eligible for overtime, and the uh, are senior executive, for example, eligible for overtime. So what we need to first of all understand this is what is covered in the Employment Act in Malawi. So in Malawi, the Employment Act is providing three types of overtime: the ordinary overtime, day off overtime, and the, uh, the weekend overtime. So it could be. A public holiday that would be like a day of weekend would be like maybe on a Sunday yeah so there are these three types of overtime which are applicable so the ordinary order overtime this is applicable on a day whereby it's a normal working day and in uh, like in context of Malawi uh, you can agree what you have agreed but the minimum of working hours should be 48 hours so you should work within for eight hours, an employee is supposed to work within a week for 48 hours. So any extra hours that one has to work beyond the 48 hours should be considered as overtime. But the Employment Act doesn't specify to say which categories of employees can work overtime. And that's why it's a very, very a problem 
because others would say he's a chief executive officer and entitled to overtime. So these are covered under the specific policies of organizations to say under which categories of employees are supposed to get overtime. So what I'm trying to say is there are certain jobs which you can be asked to do that particular task. But there are certain jobs because of your responsibility as a supervisor, as a line manager, as a director, as a CEO, as a managing director, you are supposed to do that work, not because it's overtime. You can do it at any time. You can do it any time of the day. It could be weekend, it could be at night, but you might not have to claim overtime because of the responsibility that you have. And also because you, uh, by nature, your job, you are supposed to work almost like 24 hours. Yeah? Because when you are see someone is asking you to attend to an issue at 10 p.m., would you ask for overtime? If you are a director, for example, someone is asking you to attend to an issue maybe at 3 a.m., would you ask for overtime? We know when you are at a senior position, you are always working. Yeah? Could be at lunch hour, you can go out and all that. But maybe the lower positions. So the connection will be able to define which categories of employees are entitled to overtime and which categories of employees are not entitled to overtime. And also, we should also appreciate others who do provide other allowances to cater for that, which could be equivalent of the overtime and all that, just to ensure that they are covered. But what is important is to have a clear policy on who is entitled to overtime. Because of the nature of the job, it will make it difficult for some people to claim overtime. Otherwise, if it's for the directors, for example, if you are to the claim overtime, they will be working like daily. They will be claiming the overtime. Others would provide a fixed amount per month to say this is a fixed amount because you have to work extra hours, for example. Yeah, you have to, you don't have like a period. Yeah, of course, the office work, you're supposed to work from this time to this time, but you're always working because of by nature of the position that you are holding. That's what is very, very important for us to appreciate. And also at the same time, people talk about maternity leave to say, uh, for how long can one apply for maternity leave? Yeah, how many times, for example, can one apply for maternity leave? The law, the Employment Act, specifies that one can go for maternity leave once every three years. Likewise, parental leave is um, twice. I mean, once every three years. For maternity leave is two weeks. For maternity leave, it's two months. Yeah, a minimum of two months. So the law provides for two months one has to go for or eight weeks yeah so but employer can provide more than that but now if they're saying this has to be every three years it means once every three years so what are we saying if an employee for example a female employee would like to undergo or would would like to go for maternity leave maybe twice in within those three years what should an employer do maybe he has already for example uh current in 2024 an employee is on maternity leave but in 2026 he also thinks that that same employee is also applying for maternity leave so what should happen so it all depends on discretion of the employer to say what should the employer do either to accept because also they are providing support to say we should be able to support like teaching mothers and all that but if you have got a policy to say maybe you can agree to say okay you go for unpaid maternity leave so these are some of the things which are very very important for us to appreciate you can agree with the employee to say you should go for unpaid maternity leave so that's also, also very very important for us to appreciate and also another question that people tend to ask is to say do you can you bring a lawyer can you have a legal representation when you are going for a disciplinary hearing can you have a, a, a legal representation when you are going for a hearing yeah so this is also another issue which is very important for us to to know and also to appreciate so uh, i think we should first appreciate to say Disciplinary hearing is an internal process. It's an internal process which shouldn't involve third parties. Even other people would ask to say, can you outsource services or do have a special committee? 
that has to conduct the disciplinary hearing. I think the most important thing is to say disciplinary hearing service, this service has to be done within the organization by people who are within the organization. One, the importance is that they will have familiarity of the case at hand. And this is not like a legal or a court process. No, it's an administrative process. So it has to be done internally. And the law doesn't specify to say how many people should be part and parcel of the disciplinary hearing. You can agree, depending on the number of employees that you have within the organization, you can be able to have even two, three, four, because you can have a situation whereby it's just four people within the organization. So it's not like all employees will be on the disciplinary hearing. Yeah, but because the situation that you have you might need to put in a policy, more or less like a policy, to say maybe two people, three people, or four people would be on the disciplinary hearing. And also these people should be the ones, I think I was discussing in another session, to say should be ones who are very familiar with the case at hand. Yeah, Because sometimes you might find that the case is too complicated that they may not be able to appreciate. So to answer the question to say, do you need legal representation during a hearing? I would say no, because... Uh, that that level, you have not yet reached a level where you need to have a representation of the legal person. But in, in other cases, you can have witnesses for the complainant, but also for the defendant. You can have compre I mean, you can have what witnesses, and also at the same time, the if you have got a union, you can have a union representative to witness the whole disciplinary process. That was that one is what is very very important. Now coming to another issue. I want to see under study leave, for example, if an employee is undergoing a study leave. This one is not applied, it's not applicable, uh, it's not in line with the law because the law is silent on, uh, on study leave. Uh, and what we need to appreciate is to say, if you are going for study leave, for example, it's an entitled, can you be entitled to allowances, for example, airtime, uh, fuel, uh, school fees for children, maybe house or motor vehicle? For example, uh, you are working in Blanta uh, and the, you have secured the education place in Ilongwe or you're working in Ilongwe, in you have secured the education place in Blanta or in Zomba or even abroad. So we are saying to say, should you still hold on to some other allowances and benefits? Could be uh, fuel, air time and all that. So what we should be able to appreciate are uh, these, you should be able to define, you should have a policy to say, are uh, these duty facilitating allowances? So if they are duty facilitating allowances, you should be able to get you shouldn't be able to get them because at that time when you are on study leave, you're not working. Unless if you continue working whilst you are on study leave. But most study leave will say, no, you're not working. So in that regard, you're not supposed to get mm -hmm. such kind of but also it all depends. There's no law that is guiding, but it should all depends on what you want to be in your policy. So if your policy says you should be paid, then that's okay. But if your policy doesn't say anything on that, for example, then you shouldn't be paid. Paid. Or even if your policy says that you shouldn't be paid, then such kind of allowances cannot be paid. School fees for children, for example. So you do say to say, okay, should you, when you are on study leave, are you supposed to be paid school fees for your children, for example? So it's also about policy issue. What is the policy of the organization? As I said, there is no law. So it all depends on the policy of the organization. Should you continue staying in the house, institutional house? Should you continue using the motor vehicle? For example, you have one blood. Maybe you, you, it's your wife and children. Can they continue using your institutional vehicle? So as I said earlier on, it's all about what does the policy of the institution say. So it's very, very important that each and every organization should have a policy that is determining to say what should happen when someone is you know, not... Uh, working for the organization, maybe he's on a study leave, or maybe he's sick, what should happen to these kind of allowances? So that's what is very, very important for an organization. Not Because at the end of the day, you might be able to treat people differently. So to avoid that, it's better to have a policy in place and be able to state that clearly. And also another thing that also uh, that people tend to ask is to say, when an employee is on probation, we know you, when you are, one is on probation, you can terminate without a notice. That is allowed within the Employment Act. One can resign or you can terminate his services without a notice. But 
can is it that you cannot be able to do a disciplinary hearing when one is on probation no you should have to do the disciplinary hearing it is now the termination that will be without a notice but due process has to be followed so a disciplinary hearing has to be followed uh, has to take place within the organization and the employee has to be disciplined and if it transpires that the remedy for this particular person is termination then it implies that he'll be terminated without a notice also other people would say to say whenever um, there are disciplinary hearings and maybe the alleged offender uh, we have done the hearing the alleged offender has to sign the minutes i think there's no law that says that to say the alleged offender has to sign the minutes. People would say ah, has to sign because he's confirming as true reflection of what had it was discussed at that particular disciplinary hearing. I think it all depends on how you want to frame your minutes. Because to me, I wouldn't say the disciplinary hearing, uh, this particular person whom you are hearing, yeah. Maybe you can have you can do the attendance register to say let's have the attendance register of the people who are here. So when you do the attendance register, it means whatever has been discussed there, he was part and parcel of that particular meeting. It's just when you are at a meeting, I don't think you ask everybody within the meeting to sign for the minutes. The minutes for a meeting, it could be management, could be board meeting minutes, could be any other meeting. I don't think you can ask each and every member to sign the minutes, but it could be the secretary and maybe the chair of that particular committee or of that meeting to sign the minutes. But maybe you can share to other people just to appreciate. So my understanding is to say you can share with the panel members, but not with the alleged offender. But all these members could sign the attendance register. That is what is very, very important. Could sign the confirming their attendance to that particular meeting. Because if you let the employee or the alleged offender sign the minutes, what if he doesn't agree with the minutes? So you have to work on the minutes because you are but but this is a decision that is being made by a disciplinary panel. So the disciplinary panel is making a decision and I don't think you should be able to consult the employee when you are making your decision. That's what is very, very important for us to appreciate. So, even other people tend to ask to say, uh, can you be on a maternity leave voice on probation? The other people tend to ask, can you be, uh, can an employee be on maternity leave voice on probation? As I said earlier on, it also depends on the policy of the organization. What does the police say? So during interviews, maybe you're seeing someone is pregnant and all that, and you have looked at that person and is due for maternity leave. Then it's up to you as an organization. What do you think? But what is important for us to appreciate after the amendment of the Employment Act in 2021, uh, there was the, we should be able to provide um, flexible working hours for lactating mothers. So in that regard, I still believe to say you can give that particular person the maternity leave and be able to proceed with the maternity leave and after you count now three years from that time you can also count to say she can only go again for maternity leave after three years but before the three years maybe you can say you are on unpaid leave that's what is very very important for um, us to also uh, appreciate and also their cases I think there's also another case whereby maybe if an employee has resigned whilst only investigations, could be an employee has resigned whilst being investigated, or an employee has resigned just after the disciplinary hearing, or just after being called for a disciplinary hearing. These are some of the important things, also questions that we need to be able to answer to say, what should you do? Should we be able to accept that kind of resignation? So the most important thing that for us to appreciate is to say, when an employee has resigned, or when an employee has resigned before a disciplinary hearing, or maybe um, during uh, uh, just after a disciplinary hearing, before a disciplinary hearing, or during investigations, then you can be able to not accept that resignation. You can delay the acceptance and the state to say you are not accepting you, your resignation, the other process that we are doing, and you can proceed to discipline that particular employee within the period that is saving a notice. But there are some employees 
who have to live immediately. For example, the word good you say they have got leave days and all that enough to offset with the, the notice period. Then it means the employee is living immediately. Then what he should do is he should be able to engage such kind of employees and discuss to them to say, okay, if you take this route, then ourselves also, as much as we, as an organization, we also take the litigation route. So because we were supposed to take the administrative route, but now we are living for no option but to go for the litigation. So we may be able to meet at the court. I think this is very important. Of course, I also know there are cases whereby the employee would be taken through an administrative process while the litigation process is also in progress. So we should be able to, but what is important is to engage the employees to say, I think what you are doing maybe. These are the consequences and all that. But it is right to resign at any time. It is right to resign at any time. And also sometimes looking at the magnitude of the offense, you can be able to say, I oh, know maybe you can just accept just because maybe there's no big issues. It's just like to you, it's a good riddance that he's resigning from the organization. So it all depends on the magnitude of the offense and what kind of, maybe he has got some loans and all that. How is he going to settle all those things? And yeah, maybe there is you're looking for compensation from whatever misdemeanor misconduct he did then maybe maybe you can be able to charge him and all that and you can take it the legal way if he's not willing to pay uh, for the whatever uh, has been lost as an organization and also there are certain cases whereby an employee could be arrested on an unwork related issue on an unwork related issue i'll give an example an employee uh, might have, have left his relation or underage person could be has got has committed a crime somewhere but outside the office should you because we all know if this offense is related to sexual harassment at the office it's about rape at the office you see if it's to do with him uh, maybe an employee has uh, stolen something within the office, he'll be handled as a disciplinary issue. But this would be outside work. Yeah? So we were looking at to say he's answering some charges outside work which are not work related. So should you have an issue as an organization? Yes, very important. You should have an issue because it's also causing the image of your organization. So you can be able to take that issue to that particular employee and maybe discipline him or her accordingly and because sometimes it's about tarnishing the image of the organization but also uh, sometimes it's also about you're looking at people whom you can trust if they are not want to be in a good standing in this society how can you be able to work with them in that regard so this is about also upon conviction of such cases in the court uh, law, then automatically you're also supposed to dismiss them because you, you, it's like you are not be handling uh, a convict. You are not be able to support a convict. So these are some of the things which are also very, very important for us to appreciate. So for today, let, let, let's stop here. We'll be looking at more questions and also more issues pertaining to uh, labor, HRM, and also among other things. Thank you so much for watching this uh, session five. Thank you.